Hi everyone, quantum computers might not change your everyday tasks, but they will have a massive effect on internet security. Encryption as we know it is at risk because sufficiently powerful quantum computers can break it with ease. Cryptographers have been racing to develop replacement algorithms and their efforts are finally paying off. The first quantum resistance standard is about to be released. This video has three parts, internet security, classical cryptography, and post-quantum cryptography. Part one, internet security. Of course, internet security is a vast topic and there are tons of existing attacks and defenses. Some of the most common attacks are to leverage browser or operating system vulnerabilities. So when you don't keep your devices up to date, in other words, and also to leverage the weakest link, which is the human and to send them phishing emails or other messages to trick them into installing software or performing actions on behalf of an attacker. Many of these attack vectors are not really affected by having a quantum computer. Actually, having powerful AI will have the biggest effect there because AI can find vulnerabilities more quickly, produce exploits for them, and also impersonate people very effectively at scale for phishing type attacks. But quantum computers have one property, one very scary property, which is why we're talking about them in the context of internet security. And that scary thing is that quantum computers could break all cryptography, or at least all public key encryption. This means that every secure internet connection, every HTTPS connection, essentially becomes unsecure. If you're logging into a social media account, or you're asking your bank to perform a monetary transaction, all of this could become transparent to a third party with a quantum computer. This is a so-called class break in cryptography parlance. A class break means everything, every instance of the algorithm is broken. And that's essentially what quantum computers do to encryption. They break the entire class of algorithm. The worst part is that recordings of previously encrypted connections could actually be saved now in the current day and then broken in the future when you have a quantum computer. Why do you think the NSA is so interested in intercepting and storing all of this information? Information because they, like cryptographers everywhere, know that eventually we'll be able to break this stuff. Let's talk about quantum computers a little bit. They have very interesting properties, of course. If you want a more technical description, I made a previous video on how quantum computing works. But for our purposes here, using quantum effects would probably enable perfectly secure communication between two parties if they could get together in one place at some point. Because you can use quantum entanglement to tie together two particles, give one to each person, and now all they have to do is affect this particle in some way, get it to spin or whatever, and the other particle will do exactly the same thing. Because they're entangled, they mirror the states, the manipulations, that are done to each other. And this allows for instantaneous and secure communication. It might even be faster than light depending on how much of quantum mechanics you subscribe to. But anyway, right now we don't have quantum computers, at least not ones powerful enough to tackle a cryptography problem. For that, you need hundreds or thousands of qubits at least. So our current goal is to construct algorithms that can be run on classical computers, but that are resistant to quantum attackers. This is difficult, but really important. We want to deploy these types of algorithms as soon as possible because we know that some entities are hoovering up all these connections that are secure right now, but are not going to be secure once quantum computing becomes available. And it takes many years to fully deploy new algorithms through lots of software and hardware throughout the world. Also, I don't want to imply that quantum computers grant magical hacking capabilities in some way. An attacker still has to observe, intercept your communication, and then think about it for a while. And quantum computers just let them think about it in a much better way. They can perform all this math and so on offline that helps them figure out how to break that encryption. So a lot of defensive techniques that are currently in place, for example, air gapping, which means completely separating your network from the internet would still provide complete security because the quantum computer can't just like reach across boundaries and extract information that way. Part two, classical cryptography. Cryptography is a big field and there are lots of so-called security primitives that cryptographers concern themselves with. Even if we're just talking about establishing secure communications, there are several primitives involved. We'll restrict ourselves to talking about the three most important, which are digital signatures and hashes, symmetric cryptography, and asymmetric cryptography. Digital signatures are sort of what they sound like. It's intended to be proof that you produced this piece of data and that it couldn't be forged by somebody else. Hashes are related. I'm putting them under the same umbrella here, although they're technically different primitives and hashes are just used to show that an original input was not tampered with not changed. I want to talk about SHA-1 for a minute, which is one of the most famous hashes that exist. If you're a developer and you've used the Git version control system, you've seen commit hashes. Well, those are the output of the SHA-1 algorithm. I want to talk about it because it's a nice case study of what it looks like when someone breaks an encryption mechanism. It started in the year 2005 when someone showed that theoretically speaking, you didn't actually need two to the power of 80 operations to break SHA-1. 
want, which was its supposed security guarantee, but you could do it in only two to the power of 69. So 80 became 69. It was still too big to actually do that attack, but it was possible, but it was shown to be weaker than previously supposed. 10 years later in 2015, the two to the power 69 became two to the power 57. And someone estimated that it would take around $100,000 of cloud computing cost to actually produce some collision, as long as you didn't care what that collision was. So again, that's another step towards showing this is actually a weaker algorithm than we thought. After that, in 2017, there was the actual first public collision. And this wasn't just any collision, it was a chosen plain text attack, which was even more expensive. It cost Google about $2 million in cloud computing and 110 GPU years to actually conduct this attack. And because it was a more sophisticated attack, what they came up with was a mechanism where you could start with a PDF file, insert whatever you wanted into that PDF file and have it produce the same hash. So in theory, if you have a Git repository with a PDF inside it, then someone could actually come to take that PDF and replace some of the content and it could have the same hash and Git would not know that anything had changed. In other words, the hash would have been failing at its basic purpose, which is to prevent tampering of the data. So SHA-1 is completely broken. Browsers have been deprecating it. No one's using it anymore. By the way, it's fine for Git because you don't typically have attackers putting data in like that. But for secure communications, SHA-1 is no more. And it's an interesting comparison because where are we in terms of quantum computers breaking encryption? Well, we're definitely beyond the first stage. We know that it's theoretically possible and we even have algorithms to do it. We're basically just waiting for somebody to produce a big enough quantum computer and to suddenly say, hey everyone, all these algorithms are now as broken as SHA-1. Sobering thought. But anyways, the next primitive I want to talk about is symmetric cryptography. And the reason it's called symmetric is because you use the same key to encrypt or decrypt your information. This is the most straightforward type of encryption mechanism to create and one of the oldest as well. There are plenty of broken symmetric key crypto algorithms, but those are mostly because the keys were too small. They were designed for the 80s or whatever. And modern symmetric crypto algorithms such as AES are actually very secure even if you have a quantum computer. You might have to make the key about double the size to fend off Grover attacks, but that's very easy to do. The same algorithm just works. So that brings us to asymmetric cryptography. It's a funky name, but basically you just have two keys, one of which can be used for encryption and one of which can be used for decryption. That's where the name asymmetric comes from. Another name for this type of cryptography is public key cryptography. The reason being that you can often take your encryption key and publish it publicly. That way anyone can just encrypt a message and send it to you and you keep your decryption key a tightly guarded secret. Asymmetric cryptography solves a big problem with symmetric cryptography, which is that once you've encrypted something with your key and you give it to somebody else, how are they going to decrypt it? With AES or something, you have to somehow communicate that key securely to the recipient, call them on the phone or something like that. Unless you yourself are the intended recipient of that information, then that's fine. But we're talking about internet communication here. And for that, you really need asymmetric cryptography. Okay, enough about primitives for the moment. How can you use these primitives like hashes, symmetric cryptography, and asymmetric asymmetric cryptography to actually do secure communication on the internet. In theory, you could just use asymmetric cryptography pretty much on its own, except asymmetric cryptography is very computationally expensive. So how a secure network connection works is first you use asymmetric cryptography to establish a secret key that both you and the recipient are aware of. Then you take that secret key and you use it as the key for a symmetric encryption scheme, which is very computationally efficient. And then you also use the hashing mechanism on top of it to make sure no one's tampering with the connection. So basically you want to use symmetric crypto whenever you can. It's simpler, it's quantum resistant, but it has a huge problem, which is that somehow you and the recipient both have to know the key in advance. So you're using asymmetric crypto to solve that caveat and then passing the ball off to AES again. Asymmetric cryptography is based on the hardness of some mathematical problem. For example, for the RSA algorithm, it's based on the hardness of prime factorization and elliptic curve cryptography or ECC is based on the hardness of the discrete logarithm problem. Problem. I know those are just words, so let's use an analogy. When you're trying to run the protocol called the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, that's part of an initial asymmetric key exchange when you're trying to communicate with somebody, let's say your bank. And let's use colored paint as an example. If you've ever had some primary colors of paint and you've mixed them together accidentally with a brush, you know that it's quite hard to separate those colors once they're starting to mingle. So here's the analogy. Let's say you are trying to initiate a secure internet connection with somebody like your bank. Let's use paint as an analogy. The color of the paint specifically is the key. So the algorithm works roughly as follows. You and your bank both start with a common color, like blue. You just always start with this color. Then you each pick a random secret color. So you pick red, your bank picks green, and you each mix your two colors together. Then you send those mixed colors to each other over the public internet. So an attacker can observe these mixed colors, the blue plus red and the blue plus green. But that's okay, 
because what we're assuming is that the difficult part of paint colors is to extract two paints once they've been mixed together. Now you'll take your Banks mixture and combine it with your secret color to form basically, well, what was the Banks mixture? Blue plus green plus your color, red. Blue, green, red. Now the bank will take your mixture, which was blue, red, and combine it with its secret color, which was green. Blue, red, green. And remember, you had blue, green, red. So at this point, both parties actually have the same color. It was mixed together in a different order, but both parties have the same color. And an attacker who observed those two mixtures going back and forth can't separate them into their pieces, which is necessary because you need half of one combined with the other in order to get the final color. If you're interested in a bit of the technicalities of how these asymmetric algorithms are operating, we can talk about those two hard problems, prime factorization and discrete logarithm. Basically, all these algorithms are operating in modular arithmetic. If you're a mathematician, a finite field. You can basically imagine that instead of a number line starting at zero and going off to infinity in each direction, you actually have a circle of numbers. So zero, one, two, three, and then it wraps around back to zero again, for example. That would be modular arithmetic with modulus four because you go zero, one, two, three, and back again. Addition and multiplication just cause you to wrap around the circle in one direction. Subtraction causes you to wrap around the circle backwards. And division is sometimes possible, but not always. If you have a modulus, which is a prime number, then division is possible and unique. Otherwise, division could lead to multiple possible valid answers as you're going backwards. You can even do exponentiation, of course, which is repeated multiplication. So the discrete logarithm problem, for example, says, okay, I took X and I raised it to the power Y, which involved wrapping around this circle many times in the forward direction. And the question is, I give you X, what is Y? What is the logarithm of this number, basically? So you're trying to go backwards many, many times and undo the exponentiation. That is a very difficult problem, at least if you only have classical computers. Part three, post-quantum cryptography. So we don't have quantum computers yet that can break those classical algorithms. But the question posed by post-quantum cryptography is what algorithms can we run now that would be unbreakable even when we do have quantum computers. And the question is, which primitives need replacing? Actually, existing hash algorithms are totally fine, as are symmetric cryptography algorithms, because symmetric cryptography basically just keeps executing rounds until the probability distribution is completely uniform. Again, you just have to potentially double the key size to defend against quantum computers, but those algorithms don't need changing at all. Asymmetric cryptography, however, well, there's the rub, because it's based on the hardness of a particular problem. For example, you mix two things together and it's hard to pull them apart. Or you have a one-way function that's hard to invert. There's a quantum algorithm called Shor's algorithm that can do prime factorization in polynomial time, which means very, very quickly. Shor's algorithm can also, if you use a reduction, be applied to the discrete logarithm problem and also solve it in polynomial time. So all the focus of post-quantum cryptography is basically on how do you make asymmetric cryptography again? And this is the hard part. It took many, many years to develop world-class secure algorithms like RSA. You need a one-way function that you can expose the output of that's really hard to invert. And you need a different mathematical hard problem to base that on. There are a lot of potential different hard problems that you could use, and the math gets really gnarly at this point, but I'll outline some of them briefly. You can have lattice-based cryptography, which use a mathematical primitive called lattices. You can have code-based cryptography. You can have isogeny-based cryptography. Isogenies are pretty crazy. You basically start with elliptic curves, two of them, create a mapping between between them and that's how you encode your information and the mapping is supposed to be hard to invert. Anyway, any crypto algorithm at this scale has to be published for a long time, ideally like a decade, in order for other researchers to try to break it because it's very easy to show that a scheme is broken and nearly impossible to show that a scheme is completely safe against all possible attacks. So this process has been happening recently for post-quantum algorithms. NIST is the name of the organization in the US that standardizes cryptographic algorithms and they have a call for post-quantum algorithms that ended in November 2017. They got 69 potential algorithms submitted. Now, six years later, there's only four algorithms left, and only one of those is for asymmetric key exchange. But that means it survived the sustained fire of all the cryptographers in the world, so it's probably a pretty good algorithm. It's a lattice-based algorithm, and it works by intentionally introducing errors to some equations such that those errors are easy for the participants to compute, but difficult for attackers to compute. So yes, unlike all of the standard crypto algorithms before it, this is a problem.
probabilistic algorithm, which means it has a very small chance to fail or a very small chance for an attacker to actually succeed in just breaking it. But this chance is like two to the negative 137 or something like that. So if you combine this scheme with something like hashes to show that integrity hasn't been broken, then you're probably pretty good. To give you a flavor of how this hardness problem works, I'm gonna talk linear algebra for a moment. Basically, imagine you have a series of linear equations where you're trying to solve for x, except that the coefficients aren't really known. There's error in each of the coefficients. This becomes really hard to do if you don't have any idea what x is. But if you do know what x is, you can pick an expression that is very close to correct and communicate that, and that's a zero. Or you can pick a linear equation that's actually quite far from correct, but still plausible if you don't know what x is, and then communicate that, and that's a one. So using this scheme, you basically use the noise to hide the fact that you're either communicating a correct equation or an incorrect equation, because due to the noise, they're both plausible. This problem is basically what's at the heart of this new algorithm called MLKEM. But of course, crypto being crypto, it's not just a series of linear equations over integers, it's over modules of the Cartesian product of polynomial rings. Whatever that means, linear algebra can make your head hurt. Okay, in terms of timeline, a few weeks after this video comes out, on November 22nd, 2023, that's when the final comments are due on this draft NIST proposal. In other words, for all you cryptographers out there, you have like just a few weeks to submit any potential issues that you have found with this new algorithm. I mean, they've been doing that for years, of course, so it's likely that anything they find at this phase would just involve small adjustments, but still, that's the state of this. So assuming there aren't any alarming comments, they expect to integrate them and then have this standard ready in 2024. And from there, I hope it will be rapidly integrated into computers everywhere and we'll start using it for the asymmetric algorithm, the key exchange part of all internet communication. Final note, cryptographers will have to come up with another algorithm as well, at least one more that's based on a different scheme that's not lattice-based, a different hard problem in other words. And the reason for this is math is advancing all the time and it's possible that in the future there'll be some weakness that's exposed that could affect all lattice-based cryptography. It has happened in the past with other types of schemes. So they're opening a call or they already have one open for more algorithm submissions so that they can decide on another algorithm that's not lattice-based. And knowing the speed at which these things happen, I'm sure that's still another few years away from completion. Finally, in conclusion, quantum computers pose a significant danger to internet security because they can break asymmetric cryptography. And that's one of the key first steps in establishing a secure connection with somebody. That means that the first person to develop a sufficiently powerful quantum computer can suddenly transparently read all of the secure communications that are happening on the internet. Or frighteningly, if you record and save a communication from today, then in the future, when you do get access to that quantum computer, you can decrypt today's communications, which is not quite as bad, but can still cause havoc. That's why post quantum algorithms, which means algorithms that can run today on classical computers, but that would be resistant to attack by a theoretical future quantum computer are super important. It takes years and years to develop these. They've compressed the timeline, so it only took six years this time. And a quantum resistant asymmetric algorithm is just about ready for prime time. Standard should finish in 2024. Well, I hope your brain didn't explode from too much math, but if you liked some parts of this video, you should definitely check out this previous one I made about quantum computing and what it really is and how it really works. Please like and subscribe and share this video with a friend that you think might like it. Let me know in the comments if there's any other topics you'd like to see me cover as well. All right, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.